Welcome to Amazing Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church in Granite Falls, North Carolina. We seek to share the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere. We are an open community that welcomes all people regardless of your faith background, your personal lifestyle, your geographical location, whether you are a churchgoer or not, a seeker or a devout follower. We seek to provide you with a meaningful experience and to be a place where you can come to draw strength and inspiration and connect with God's spirit and your own in order to enrich your life. We offer thoughtful and soul-provoking worship, preaching, teaching, and music, and we're glad you joined us. And now let us begin with the brief order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sins. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us. So that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope. For hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now proceed as the reconciled and forgiven beloved of God. Our opening hymn this morning is Where Cross the Crowded Ways of Life. Where cross the crowded ways of life, where sound the cries of race and clan, above the noise of selfish strife, we hear your voice. O Son of Man, O Master from the mountainside, make haste to heal these hearts of pain among 
tread the city streets again till all the world shall learn your love and follow where your feet have trod till glorious from your heaven above shall come the city of our God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson is from Amos 7, 1 through 17. This is what the Lord God showed me. He was forming locusts, at the time the latter growth began to sprout. It was the latter growth after the king's mowings. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O oh Lord God, forgive, I beg you. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord God was calling for a shower of fire, and it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. Then I said, O oh Lord God, cease, I beg you. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am sending a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words, for thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there, and prophecy there, but never again prophecy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophecy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. The psalm for the day is 89, verses 1 through 4 and 15 through 18. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exalt in your name all day long and extol your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. 
The second lesson is from Romans 6, 12 through 23. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your member to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater inequity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Jesus said, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the inspirations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord. Amen. I begin this morning with a story from the days following the end of World War I. Apparently, in the days following that war, victory parades were planned by U.S. General John Joseph Blackjack Pershing that were to include marches through the many European capitals that had been liberated during that war. The general, writing from France, where the Treaty of Versailles was signed, sent out an order for 27,000 model soldiers to march in those parades. Each participant was to meet two qualifications according to that letter. The soldier was to have an unblemished military record and was to stand at least one meter, 86 centimeters tall. The message was communicated in metric measurements because the assistant forwarding the message was French and France has been on the metric system since 1790. Well, four low-level soldiers who guarded an ammunition dump about 100 miles from Paris read the general's invitation with great interest, since those selected would receive an extra duty pay and have the opportunity to travel 
and received public accolades all across Europe. Each man in the company met the first qualification without a sweat, being exemplary soldiers with spotless records. However, the second condition of the general's orders left them a little puzzled. Because you see, no one in the small company was familiar with the metric system, even though they had served alongside of the French during the war. They did not know how high one meter, 86 centimeters tall was. And since nobody in the camp knew how tall that was, they began to compare themselves against one another. They stood back to back like children in a kindergarten until they knew the tallest and the shortest person in the company. A soldier, we shall call him Beanpole, was the tallest and the thinnest of the bunch. And feeling suddenly boastful, Beanpole began kidding the others about all the meals he was going to enjoy and the postcards that he was going to send back to the others from the many capitals of Europe. But another soldier, whom we'll call Dynamite, because he was a little shorter, but he was powerfully compact and very, very well built, and he challenged Beanpole. Feeling confident, he said he was going to qualify, and if he qualified, everyone else in the company was going to qualify, so Beanpole had nothing to boast about. When a captain from headquarters arrived to inquire who qualified for the general's special duty orders, the soldiers told him their problem. We're all ready to go, sir, but we have a problem. We don't know how tall one meter, 86 centimeters is. Seeing the problem, the captain took out his French meter stick and converted the measurement to feet and inches and made a mark on the mess hall wall. Some of the men stared up at that mark and immediately turned away, knowing that they did not meet the required height standard. Others began to stand up against the wall, stretching their shoulders and spines to stand as tall as they could, but they fell short of the mark by an inch or more. Finally, Boastful soldier Beanpole approached the wall after thumping his chest. He stretched himself as tall as possible against the mark with a confident smirk. Suddenly, laughter broke out in the room because you see, Beanpole fell one quarter of an inch short of the height requirement. So not one of them stood six feet and one-fifth inches tall, or in other words, one meter and 86 centimeters. Now, I tell this story this morning as we continue the summer of love on a day that we are going to consider the topic, the measure of love. And I ask you, how do you measure love? In meters, centimeters, and feet, and inches, do you measure it based on other people in your company? How do you measure your love? Do you measure it against your family? Against your neighborhood? Do you measure it against people that look like you, talk like you, people that have the same socioeconomic status as you? people in the same religious or political affiliation? What do you use for the measure of love? Well, the prophet Amos, we are told in the seventh chapter of his little book, recounts a vision that he received from God which might help us answer that question. He says, this is what God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, 
Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Now, let me stop a second and explain what a plumb line is. It's a pendulum-like object used by builders and mariners. It's a string with a weighted arrowhead-like object hanging from the end of it. And it's used for one of two purposes. In mariner trades, it's used to find the depth of water. In construction trades, it relies on gravity to, de to determine the vertically perfect straight line of an upright surface like a wall. Apparently, when God spoke to Amos, he was speaking of a plumb line against a wall, so he was speaking to Amos in construction and building terms. So, he's talking about measuring the vertical sway or uprightness of a structure, comparing the vertical stance of a wall to a standard. But the Amos story goes on. Then the Lord said, See, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. Hmm. So God's not measuring a wall against a construction plumb line standard. No. Apparently, God is measuring his people against a godly plumb line standard. Comparing Amos' story to the one told earlier about the soldiers, the vision Amos receives says that God is a measuring God who holds people of faith up to a mark on a wall against a measure of perfect uprightness that indicates our individual sway from the straight line of God's plumb line. Now previously in Amos, we learned that God's plumb line is set by one thing and one thing only. And that's God's law, which is a law of love. What does the law say? Jesus said, Love God with your whole heart and love your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole of the law. Well, so far in this series, we've learned a couple of things about love. We've learned that love, as Amos speaks of it, is not a feeling. It's an action. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gates. This is the nature of godly love. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That is the content and intention of godly love. So together, this is the plumb line standard by which we are measured. So, as a result, Amos says, The Lord despises your festivals, burnt offerings, and singing. Because, why? Because we fill our places of worship to capacity with loud festivals, singing, and all sorts of religious activities while ignoring the welfare of our neighbors. And we go on marches, singing of God's favor and love while we trample the poor, the disenfranchised, and the oppressed. And when asked the question, how do we measure our love? Like the soldiers in our earlier story, what do we do? We simply look around and compare ourselves to the ones around us. And we ask ourselves, how's everyone in my social group doing? How's everyone in my family doing? How's everyone in my church doing? If I'm doing at least what they're doing, 
then I must be good. But friends, God uses a different metric. God uses the plumb line standard of God's just love. So let me ask you, how do we fare against God's plumb line just love? Do we measure up? Or are we a lot smaller people than perhaps we think we are? I heard another story from the sports news that brings this point home. Seems that the University of Tennessee football coach bought a bolt of bright orange cloth thinking he would have a suit made out of it to show his volunteer pride. He took the material to his tailor in Knoxville where the tailor measured him and then examined the bolt of cloth. The tailor did some computations and said, I'm sorry coach, but there just isn't enough material in this bolt to make a suit for you. Well, the coach was disappointed, but he threw the bolt of cloth in the trunk of his car with no idea what he was now going to do with this orange cloth. But a few weeks later, he was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, the home of the Crimson Tide, arch enemies of the Vols. He was on his way to the coast for a vacation, and he was driving down Main Street in Tuscaloosa when he noticed a tailor shop which reminded him that he had the bolt of cloth in his trunk. He stopped, thinking he could get a second opinion from a tailor about making him a suit. Well, the tailor measured him and measured the bolt of cloth and did some computations. And finally she said, Coach, I can make you a suit out of this bolt. And I can also make you a pair of pants if you like. But if you really want it, I can even make you a vest. The coach was suddenly happy to hear about this, but he was really, really dumbfounded. I don't understand, he said. My tailor in Knoxville told me that he couldn't even make one suit out of this bolt of cloth. To which the tailor said, Coach, here in Tuscaloosa, you're not nearly as big a man as you are in Knoxville. And the truth is, Neither are we as big a people as we may think we are at home when we measure ourselves only against each other and not against the plumb line of God's law of love and justice. The good news in all of this is that we can stop comparing ourselves to other people. And we can certainly drop the boasting. For in the final analysis, we, like the men of General Pershing's time, all fail to measure up to the standard of God's law of love. The required measure of love is only fulfilled in us by grace through Christ Jesus our Lord. But does that abolish God's plumb line? Not at all. Because God's law still calls us to righteousness, justice, and love. The good news, the real presence of Jesus Christ is with us, calling us, justifying us, sanctifying us, and sending us, empowering us to rise, to seek good for all, to hate evil and love good, to let justice roll, to love deeper, to serve better, and to be lifted up by the blood of the Lamb, and to stand and walk right as accepted and beloved marchers in God's victory parade. And why? All for the sake of love. In Christ's name, amen. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one in the Spirit, we are one.
our faith, confessing the creed in which we baptize. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of companionship, encourage our relationships with our siblings in Christ. Bless our conversations. Shape our shared future and give us hearts eager to join in a festal shout of praise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and to be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities judges, and politicians to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, meet hate with love, and welcome one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Comfort those who are sick, lonely, or abandoned. Strengthen those who are in prison or awaiting trial. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission and the vision to recognize where you are leading us. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of love, we ask now that you hear the prayers that we offer up, both those silent and those spoken. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of love, you gather in your embrace all who have died. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share the peace where you are. At this time, I invite you to submit your tithes and offerings for the grace you have received from God. You may make your offering through the mail or commit your offering here online from whatever site you are joining us. Let us pray. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. All that we have is yours and our offering is but a token of our trust and appreciation for your benevolence. Water and word, these are the signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song, amen. And now, as we prepare to close, let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction. 
neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Father, Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Our new hymn this morning is All Who Love and Serve Your City. And I want to point out that the tune for this song was written by Dr. Paul Weber, who was the a cappella choir director at Lenoran University for many, many years. And he only retired maybe five, six years ago, something like that. So All Who Love and Serve Your City. mission, which is to grow in faith by seeking the will of God and sharing his love with all people. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.